at the first annual, first annual Evolution Expo. And we get to meet heroes. Right. Hey, my, some of my heroes, there you go. Introduce yourself, Mr. Joe Edwards, of course. Joe Edwards. And Wendy Lawrence. Yes, Wendy Lawrence, nice to meet you. And nobody, you don't want to know about this guy, so you know, it doesn't matter, it doesn't matter. So of course, so why don't you, uh, why don't you uh, explain why we're here and what this is all about? Well, I'd say we're representing the science side of the house. So Wendy and I uh, went to college together. We majored in engineering, and it was the foundation for everything that we've done in aviation and the space program. So we've come here to play a small part with, uh, with folks that are real celebrities and, and have the opportunity to meet and, uh, and spend some time with some parents and some young people. Now, what I'd like to know from both of you, when did your fascination with space come in, in, into play when you were ch children or when you were older? What? Well, actually for me, it probably began before I was born. My dad also was in the Navy, flew jets, a Navy test pilot, and was involved in the selection process for the Mercury astronauts. And I made it down to the final cut when he was disqualified with a small medical problem. So Alan Shepard and John Glenn, those were family friends. But it was really the Apollo program. That's what I was old enough to remember. And it was watching Neil Armstrong and Buzz Aldrin walk on the moon for the first time where I said, oh, that really looks like a fun job to have. I think I, think I might want to do that when I grow up. Yeah. But not as easy as you thought, right? Not, e not anybody can become an astronaut. No, no. And I think Joe would echo everything I say here. It's a process. It's a long path. And I like to look at the kids and say, it took me 25 years before the dream of flying in space came true. And it all starts with a good education. And for us, we opted for engineering. But as Joe said, that was the foundation that we built the rest of our career on. What about you? When did your fascination with space come from? A lot like Wendy, I was raised in a military family. My dad was Air Force. I, by the time I was 12 years old, I lived half my life outside the United States. So I had a, kind of a bit of a more of a big picture view of the world. And uh, frankly, I wanted to uh, be a Navy, Navy fighter pilot, and I wanted to win the Cold War. And uh, along with that, I uh, had the opportunity to test fly airplanes and eventually um, head down to Houston and fly the space shuttle. So I was a young boy. Now, along the way, um, were there any challenges that you guys met where you thought, oh, maybe I don't, maybe I don't want to do this, or anything that, anything that, that may, might have prevented you from uh, achieving your dream, basically? Uh, my size has always been a challenge for me. Um, it's easier for me to tell you what I could fly in the Navy than what I couldn't fly in terms of aircraft because I didn't fit in them. So that's always been something I struggled with. It was an issue for me at NASA. I don't fit the big white spacewalking suit, so that kept me from a lot of flights. But, yeah, there were. I tell that to kids, too. It's a long path. There are ups and downs. Um, I just told Joe the other day, and he, he had a hard time believing this, but the first math test I took during my master's degree program at MIT, I flunked. Whoa. And you're like, oh, gosh, welcome to grad school. So <laughs> it, I really had to buckle down and work really, really hard. It was an incredibly challenging program. That, and I, it's, I seriously doubted whether or not I would be able to get my master's in engineering. But you just have to do it one step at a time. And what about you? For me, there was never a day in my life that I regretted flying airplanes and spacecraft. Okay. Loved every minute of it. Okay. Now, of course, for somebody like myself, who is way too young to understand Buzz Aldrin and Neil Armstrong, walking on the moon. For me, my first experience with space, unfortunately, I should say, was with the Challenger explosion. I was in high school, we watched it live. That is something that can probably scar a person, you know, but for you guys at that time, maybe achieving your dream, what, what did something like that do to, to, to you know, does it, does it encourage you to maybe uh, teach more kids about, well, you know, that it's, it's a challenge, but I mean. Well, at that point, both Joe and I had been flying in the Navy for several years, and so there's a lot of risk associated with flying on and off of ships, and you have to come to terms with that. And of course, Challenger was a very tragic accident, but I looked at it and, and it just reinforced to me the fact that the job that I was already in and then the job that I wanted to do, there was a fair amount of risk. And that's just the way it is in life. Mm -hmm. Everything we do has risk, and mm -hmm. the way you approach this is trying to figure out what areas are going to give you problems and then have a plan in place to minimize the rent, the risk, the chance that it's going to occur, and if it does occur, the, the resulting consequences. So it, to me, um, as tragic as that accident was, I think it just reinforced my desire to be a part of the space program to make sure that it, that something like that didn't happen again. And how about you? Well, you know, as military pilots, 
Uh, no, on a daily basis, probably no one understands the risks that's associated with aviation and space flight more than we do. So, uh, you know, one of the special things that I think we look for in people that wanted to join the astronaut corps is folks that had the, the kind of dedication that we did and understanding that you had to work very, very hard, but you also realized that there were going to be sacrifices. Yeah. Some of them were smaller, yeah. some of them were kind of eternal, yeah. but it, that's a, that was a part of the business. Yeah. And, and I remember uh, the very next year going to Hawaii and visiting Ellison Onizuka's uh, uh, gravesite, you know, uh, one of the, who was one of the astronauts who perished in that, in that terrible tragedy. And just for me, these are heroes. I mean, you think you talk about Superman. I mean, come on. These are the real Superman and Superwomen. But what I would like to know from you guys, no, that's true. That's true. But what I would like to know from you guys is, is um, what did you expect when, when you flew into space? Would you, I mean, because we all have, have these thoughts about outer, you know, uh, life in outer space, you know, other, other life forms. What, what were you guys expecting and did it meet your expectations? I expected to do everything perfectly, and I expected my crew to do exactly the same thing. Yeah. How about you? <laughs> I, your expectation is to go up there and do your mission, which you've been training to do for the last year, year and a half. And so that's, yeah, first and foremost, that's your focus, and it's nice to have an opportunity to finally be up in space and do that. But you, you make sure you take the time to enjoy the experience because the view out the window of this planet is just hard to put into words. Yeah, uh, the beauty like is just um, spectacular. And the fact that you're no longer uh, encumbered by gravity, that you're floating all the time, that's a very unique environment, also one that's hard to put into words. So um, you've got the very professional side of you that's focused on mission accomplishment, making sure you do everything perfectly, as Joe said. And you also have the side that's, wow, I'm finally here. I'm just going to savor this experience. Yeah. Yeah. So my, my question there is, so now you, you've achieved it. You're out in space. Did it change your perspective on things at all? I've read that uh, uh, some of the astronauts, once they're out in space, they actually see the Earth from that perspective. It changes them, in some, sometimes in profound ways. I think one thing that surprised me looking out the window when we're over the part of the earth where the sun was shining what we call the daylight part of the orbit you know you were up high enough to see the curvature of the earth and then i just remember how deeply black space seemed to be this just intensely black void of space that's stretched on forever and ever and the one struck uh, thought that struck me at the time was wow the earth looks so small and, right, right. and fragile and it looks like this vast black expanse just wants to swallow it up and so I think that was my thought um, I guess it drove home this thought that wow the earth is 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 fragile in many ways and we need to come back and do a better job of taking care of it mm -hmm. yeah that sounds like it's been was that same for you well I uh, after STS 89 I had a relative of mine ask me if I became closer to God when I was <laughs> in orbit and I told her the truth the truth was you know, a couple, three hours before launch, Wendy and I would go out there and man up a four and a half million pound bomb. Yeah. And for eight minutes and 32 seconds of the ascent, the space shuttle main engines would burn cryogenic hydrogen and oxygen liquid at the rate of a swimming pool's worth a second. And I thought it to my advantage to be intimately familiar with the Almighty before <laughs> the engines lit, rather than waiting to be yeah. kind of nerve wracking yeah. after they shut off. Yeah, that's a great way to put it. <laughs> Yeah. I like that. Yeah. That's, That's got to be a nerve-wracking experience yeah. to a certain extent. You're strapped in. There's not much you can do. It's not nerve-wracking. It's, it's fun and it's challenging. And, you know, it's, it's what Wendy and I always did, whether it was an airplane, a helicopter, or a spacecraft. Right. You know, we were, we were out there to accomplish a mission.